This is Elliot Schwartz, and I'm here at Icebox with Peter Nagy for the opening of his show, Entertainment Erases History, works 1982 through 1990, curated by Richard Malazzo. Peter's just gotten off a plane from India, and he's going to take us through the exhibition. Um, well, we should start with the earliest works which are in 1982. I think this piece, um, I actually studied communication design at Parsons. I didn't study um, fine art, but then I didn't take as much um, fine art history and theory as I could. Um, and started the gallery, Nature Mart, in the East Village in 82, and then started with these works, which very much you can see. I mean, it's graphic design um, and playing with found images um, and adding captions to them. And I think this was, these are the first, it seems that Richard has them in a chronological order. And um, so it sort of makes sense. You can see the way it kind of goes from a more um, page layout, because I, I have studied um, publication design a lot, and then moving into something that was, um, for me, the breakthrough being this piece, Passe Esme. I can't remember, I was asked to do something in the shape of a star for some show or some magazine. Um, I was very um, um, infatuated with futurism at the time. So, um, um, Marinetti, the arch enemies of the futurists were the Passeists, the people that lived in the past. So I spun it around and, and, and that was also, if you think about 1982, it was the, the trans and, and postmodernism, a lot of the return to figurative painting. Um, so a lot of the art world was very um, sort of steeped in the sort of posseist sense of a return to painting, especially um, European painting. But then I got involved with um, sort of making art historical diagrams and actually taking other people's works of art and, and, and turning them, uh, again, playing with logos because that's something I had done a lot in college. Um, and start playing with um, other people's art. I was also, you know, I still am a huge fan of Louise Lawler's work. Um, so a lot of this was very much of the time. A lot of these pieces, I made collages, they were only for reproduction. So no one ever saw the actual collage, it was never exhibited. The collage was made to be reproduced in infinite editions. And the pieces were also made for publication, so they would be, they would be for magazines and catalogs. And that proved very effective at the time, where there was a lot of sort of fan scenes, um, where Richard Malazzo and, and his wife Tricia Collins started one. Um, so a lot of these did function in that way. They got reproduced um, in many different types of magazines. Um, and there was no real, hey, watch out for the <laughs> There was no real um, original, per se. The, 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 the work of art was the, um, was the reproduction. But then I did, I used to laminate them and sell them. So you had a five, a five, dollar, a five cent Xerox that I could sell for five dollars. If it was laminated, I think it was 10 or 15 dollars. And then I moved to, from laminating these eight by tens up into this stage, which is just making bigger, bigger Xeroxes and bigger laminates. This piece using the, the map of the new Museum of Modern Art that reopens in 1984 and splicing it all together. Um, international survey condominiums. And then be quite specific about the images I'm using. These are all works of art that are in the collection of MoMA um, put into there. And then that went, well, this was probably the, the title piece of the show and one of the most famous pieces, Entertaining a Racist History. Um, and then I took, went from that step to this step, which was very much taking the large Xerox and gluing it onto the canvas. I think most of them have fared a bit better than this one. But um, I liked very much that it was on paper, but it was on canvas. It was still this space of advertising and posters and graphic design, but jumping into the space of painting. And then I went to this. Um, in 1984, both my father and my grandmother died of cancer. So when you have, I think, um, family dying of cancer, you're na you naturally gravitate towards um, literature about cancer. Um, we were all steeped in post-structuralist semantics in those days, Jean Baudrillard and Lyotard and all that. Um, but then I was reading about cancer and started seeing cancer as a metaphor for the way um, 
reproduction techniques were moving, but also the way capitalism moved as a sort of virus reshaping the body in its own image. Um, so I started what I called the Cancer Logo series to make cancer paintings. These are actually the first actual paintings I ever made. But again, the image was completely constructed as a Xerox. Now these, many people thought that I, what I was doing was taking pictures of cancer cells and blowing them up and making paintings. These are again, it's still the clip art and the found imagery that comes from the Xerox work. But now I was, what I said, I was applying the pathology of cancer to the production of signs. So these were all found clip art things that I collected from newspapers and magazines and spliced them together to render the whole abstract, um, sort of like a fake abstract painting, sort of riffing on um, abstract expressionism. Even though I can still see, I can see the, the, the representational images that I've joined together. And in some cases there's only like, this maybe has three, this one maybe had about four, this one I think is just two. I still have a sense of what those images are that I put together, but I never identified them. I never told people what they were because I wanted the, the, the new hybrid to be read as an abstraction. And that went to this body of work, which was, um, I mean, I was in my late 20s. I was traveling in um, Europe and uh, a lot for the first time and becoming quite infatuated with Baroque and Rococo architecture and started seeing that as a sort of cancerous version of the classical. Um, so we can, and then, and then again, these are constructed like the, um, like the cancer logos. It's, it's black and white photocopies, usually taken out of books, spliced together to, to create a sort of um, more complicated hybrid than the original is, and then blown up and painted by hand. This one based on um, Roman Baroque architecture, but then this one, this is a multiple painting that was produced by um, a gallery called Baron Boissante. Um, in New York. So this was, again, this is the late 19th century architecture um, spliced together to make a more complicated whole. But this was a, published in an edition. This was an edition of, well, it's not an edition of 10, I don't think. Um, this is a silk screen. This is not a half painted painting. And then the latest works in the show were these, which again, these are completely constructed out of Xerox photocopies. But then um, these are enamel silk screens on a baked enamel steel. Um, and then this again, a lot of the work had to do with my travels, traveling around the world, becoming infatuated with different cultures and the signs and the systems of those cultures. So this, these pieces very much come out of um, going to Egypt in 1989. Um, they are the plans of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, but spliced together with the plans of the Egyptian Museum in Torino, which is the second oldest Egyptian. You've got then the, the engineering, these are the actual engineering diagrams for when they moved Abu Simbel. Um, and then combining them all together to sort of make a spaceship type of thing. And then this was simply um, uh, fundamentalistic, or this is just, um, logos and pieces all from um, Islamic carpets with, I guess, some things from um, um, Islamic uh, mosaics and things. But there is an outer structure of, a, of a, some Quranic diagram. Is that long? Perfect. Peter, <laughs> thank you very much. You're